It's really nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I did not. Uh, for a little bit. Uh, today is a very special day for a number of different reasons, uh, but the most obvious, I think, is staring at us in our face here. This is our brand new uh, high-def uh, TV or projection screen. I don't know what it's technically called, but it's a pretty uh, spectacular wonder here. It's, uh, I think it's like 10 feet by 10 feet. It, uh, it took over a month to custom build and install it here. So you are getting to see its maiden voyage. Uh, but of course, that means that we've had a few little technical hiccups already <laughs> and may, as we go through our talk uh, going forward, but we're really excited to uh, test this out uh, today. I think it's a perfect talk for it uh, because our talk today is on the Mitchell map, which happens to be one of the most important maps in the history of early America. In fact, it's a map that still influences legal discussion and even decisions today, dealing with borders and boundaries and the rights of Native Americans and in Canada, and it's a map. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it is what is this physical dimension? It's it's large. Is it? Yeah, um, it is a huge map. And I, is that its regular size? Okay. Yeah, six feet by four feet. So perfect for for the screen today to to showcase this map and get into some of the details that are that are on it. And afterwards, I invite everybody to come up and take a look at at the map itself. I uh, want to make a few just general housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, that's uh, the first is some upcoming events after the new year. Um, the first is there's going to be a lunch at the library, uh, the first one of 2024 on January 17th. And the speaker is going to be John Ragosta, uh, who's a historian at Monticello, a really well-regarded historian. He was a lawyer who then got his PhD and has written extensively on the early republic. His next book is For the People, for the country, Patrick Henry's final political battle. And while that, why that's important for us here is that the story that Rogasta tells is Washington asking his friend, who had been often on the other side of uh, political disputes, Patrick Henry, Washington asked Henry to come out of retirement to help defend him. And that's part of uh, the story of his book. So that's a lunch at the library on January 17th. That's one of those lunches where we will provide a box lunch for you if you register. Um, so please check it out online and register. The seating is limited uh, because of the amount of lunches we have in space here. So please register as quickly as you can. And then the very next day is our first evening book talk. That's on January the 18th. And it's featuring Michael Blakeman, who is a professor at Princeton University, but also a former fellow here at Mount Vernon. And he's going to be talking about his new book, Speculation Nation, Land Mania in, Revolution, in the Revolutionary American Republic. And this is a story that Washington was a part of as well, which is about all the hope and opportunity that uh, rested in the Western lands and how Americans were trying to develop that land in the early republic. So that's on the evening of January the 18th. Uh, that's Michael Blakeman. Uh, and please register online for that as well. But today, we're here to welcome our colleague, uh, Alexandra Montgomery, uh, who is a historian holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Her own work is also on land and development. And uh, she is the manager of the Center for Digital History here at the Presidential Library. And the Center for Digital History does a number of innovative projects to make our materials more accessible to a wider public, but also interpret them uh, for the public uh, to show them what these materials can tell us about the past. And her uh, signature project right now is something called Argo, American Revolutionary Geographies online, and what that project is doing is digitizing all the maps 
from the era of the American Revolution, not just here at Mount Vernon, but across the globe, and creating a unified repository that allows researchers, scholars, students, teachers to access this material and use it in new ways. And her talk today is featuring one of those maps, maybe one of the most important maps from the era. It's the Mitchell map. So, Paula? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, so, re technical issues. I just want to, uh, I'm talking to the tech staff in the back. Are my levels okay with this mic? Do I sound okay? Well, because I, I have a lapel mic. Um, Okay, well, I'm just going to get going. Um, so, hello, everybody. Uh, sorry for a bit of a jumpy start. As uh, Dr. Shiro mentioned, this is the debut of this beautiful new screen. Um, for those of you that have been in this room before, you can tell it is no longer a series of small tiles. Now it is one giant, beautiful tile. Uh, much like the Mitchell map is a series of sheets coming together to make one big, beautiful map, tile. I'm, I'm trying to make a connection here. Um, anyway. <laughs> So this is the third of a series of three uh, talks that I've been giving over the course of the last several months discussing uh, some of the most important maps of the 1750s. Now, the 1750s was important for map making in the North American context because this is the decade where map making in North America really took off. Um, and it is also a, a, a sort of a pivot moment where maps became more generally accessible to people at large. Uh, this is a talk that was just actually done for the first time here in Illinois in a European Bureau map making context. So that, this is our final sort of penultimate one where we'll be talking about sort of the uh, This is Philip Webb. His ears has been to any of the previous lectures. It's okay, so not bad. But don't worry, we'll be retreading some of the story. Um, and I'll be doing a little review of the maps we already discussed. This will hopefully not be too repetitive for those of you who are here, but hopefully give everyone the context that they need uh, for this lecture. So first, though, I do want to give a shout out again to Argo. That's argomaps.org. Um, Argo Maps, as Dr. Shiro mentioned, is a uh, online project. It's being run by ourselves and our friends at the Leventhal Center up in Boston. It is your one-stop map shop for 18th century maps. Uh, we're currently in public beta. Please check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who are listening online, hello. Um, you can go to this site to find digitized copies of the Mitchell Map so that uh, if you can't be here in person to look at our reproduction and then also in person after this lecture, we pulled a couple of sheets from our original copy of the map so that you can look at them a little bit more closely. But if you're not here with us in person, you can do a similar kind of thing on mitchellmaps.org. So check it out. It's a lot of fun. At least I think so. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, so I want to do a little bit of retreading. The first of all is why are maps important at this institution? Um, this is George Washington. It's not Vernon. It is not map town. <laughs> but I would make the argument that maybe that's the same thing. <laughs> uh, so George Washington, as, as an individual, was someone who was very, very interested in maps. So he interacted with maps on a number of levels. First of all, mo most primarily, he made them. He was trained as a surveyor. This was kind of his first job, quote unquote, as a young man. Um, he did professional surveying work. We hold several of his surveys here at the library. And he continued to make maps long after his professional career ended. He made maps all through the American Revolution, and his last map was made very shortly before he died. So this was something that was a skill that he took with him throughout his life. He also um, collected maps by, made by other people. So this is a sample from the, one of his uh, financial ledger books that shows him purchasing the John Henry map of Virginia in 1770. Um, when he died, his probate inventory listed uh, almost 60 loose maps and probably more lumped together in descriptions like several maps, several charts, a book of plans. Um, and I've mentioned before, I will mention again, that this is an era when maps are becoming more and more accessible, but this is a truly exceptional amount of maps for anybody, which makes sense. It is, after all, George Washington. So that's just a little bit of review. And you will see as this story unfolds with the Mitchell map, uh, Washington will come up several times. Um, he interacted directly with this map, although in a slightly different way than he did with some of the other maps that we have already discussed in this series. So popularization of maps. Oh, that suddenly got a lot louder. Thank you, everyone. Like I said, there, there are pluses and minuses to being the first person to try out the new setup in the room. <laughs> so I hope you and you all online as well will bear with us as we kind of figure out the best way to use this 
fantastic space and fantastic stream. But anyway, the popularization of maps. So as I mentioned before, the 1750s is this pivot moment. Maps go from being these rarefied objects that very few people have access to, uh, to being something that people, even relatively sort of common people or middling people or, you know, not grand lord, high poobah, et cetera, et cetera, have access to and have in their home. Um, and, people, and you see that in all kinds of different ways. You see that in a great increase of number of advertisements for maps. This is an example from the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1756. Um, you also see it uh, in the way that maps are used as material objects at home. This is a later painting. This is from about 100 years after the period we're talking about. But it still shows the way in which maps were being used as sort of decorative objects within the home, much in the same way that I think people still do today. Uh, show of hands, who all has maps on their walls at home? Let the record show that a lot of people raise their hand. Um, <laughs> and again, in that way, we are just like people in the past. People in the 18th century were not just using maps to get around. They were also using them to improve their spaces. They were losing them to learn. Um, and they were using them um, to, in some ways, kind of show and demonstrate that maybe they were a, a fancier and more intellectual type of person uh, than someone who had something a little bit less you know, nice on their walls. Again, just like today. Um, but maps were also used in public, and this was true before 1750, but it is increasingly true afterwards as well. And this is the context in which the map we're talking about today, the Mitchell map, is arguably the most important. So especially very large maps would be displayed in public and semi-public places, especially governmental places. We will come back to this image, but this is an image of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And in the background, you can see some shapes on the wall, and at least one of those is a map. Um, and it is, in fact, no spoilers, well, spoilers actually a lot, it's the Mitchell map. <laughs> oh. All right, so let's do a little recap um, of the maps that we've already talked about in this series, which I have taken to calling the 1750s All-Stars. So this is your all-star lineup of 1750s maps. Um, starting, and we're going to go in the order in which I discussed them. So again, this is to give everybody, whether you are here or not, a little refresher on what we've already talked about so we can put the Mitchell map in this context. So the first one we looked at was the Fry Jefferson map. So this was made in the early part of the decade. This is a map of Virginia. Um, so as you can see, we've got the Eastern Seaboard, we have the Chesapeake, and it sort of reaches off back uh, towards the mountains. This map was made by uh, Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson, the father of another famous Jefferson. Yes, it's Thomas and was considered to be the, um, the finest map of Virginia and really was kind of the default best map of Virginia uh, until almost the 19th century. So this map had a long afterlife. And as we will see, um, it was used as a source, as a resource for later map makers, making maps of this area as well as areas beyond. That is the Fry Jefferson map. It also, as we discussed, has a very notable cartouche showing kind of an idealized Virginia um, one that is very wealthy, one that is centered on uh, the planter class. You can see images um, of sort of wealthy, but wicked men um, using enslaved people to ship out large casks full of tobacco. This was made in London by people who had never been to Virginia, but as I said at the time, it didn't matter. It was selling a particular image of the place, one that is prosperous, one that is um, forward thinking, one that is you know powerful and has come into its own as a colony. So that is the Fry Jefferson map. This map was uh, also, this was published um, in England. Unlike this map, this was the second map we talked about. This is the Lewis Evans map of the middle colonies of North America. So we've gone from Virginia and we've kind of zoomed out a bit to a larger area. So you can see some of the Great Lakes um, up in the top um, and you can see this larger area. And this was made like the Fry Jefferson map. Um, it was released in 1755. Uh, so basically all three of these maps were hitting the height of their accessibility in 1755. That's another thing to know about these maps. And this one, Unlike Fry Jefferson, this was published in the colonies. This was published in uh, Philadelphia. Um, and like the Fry Jefferson map, it's had its origin um, in the increasing amount of tension between the British and the French in the area that it's being depicted in this map. And we'll talk about this much more because this is also important for the context of the Mitchell map. But it's important to remember that this is, in some ways, um, this is the American response to those tensions. And the Fry Jefferson map and the Mitchell map were more of a London response to those tensions. So those are our two maps that we have already discussed. Um, and this is our map we're going to discuss today, as seen here, as seen here. 
So this is the, um, this is colloquially known as the Mitchell map. Its full title is um, a map of the British colonies in North America for the roads, distances, limits, and extent of the settlements humbly inscribed to the Right Honorable the Earl of Halifax and the other Right Honorable the Lord's Commissioners for Trade and Plantation. Like all these maps, we're just, we're, it's the Mitchell map. We're just gonna call it the Mitchell map. It's much easier for everyone involved. Um, so as you can see, this is a map which is on a larger scale in two ways from the previous two maps that we discussed. It's a larger scale, first and most obviously, because it is all of North America, or at least all of North America, Eastern North America, or at least all of Eastern North America, kind of in between Labrador and the middle of Florida. My condolences to Florida. Um, sorry about that one. But this is considered to be, when people are saying North America at this point, in an English-speaking context or a French-speaking context, they're really this is this is what they're thinking of. This is the geographic area. Um, people are not really engaging. Um, the Europeans are not really engaging so much with the Pacific Coast yet. That is yet to come. But it's also on a bigger scale um, in terms of its sheer size, right? So here, I, I did this before. Here is the Fred Jefferson map as a size comparison with the Evans map. Although the Evans map is portraying a larger geographical area, it is physically much smaller. Um, the Evans map is a one-sheet map. This is in part because it is published in Philadelphia. They didn't have the kind of fancy infrastructure that the Brits did, um, whereas the uh, Fry Jefferson map was published over there. Um, so those are those two in their size comparison. And then let's bring in our friend, the Mitchell map, which is much larger yet again. Um, as was mentioned, it's about six feet by four feet. For those of you who are here, we have a reproduction um, of that map sort of up at front that normally ha hangs on my office wall. Um, I was sad to see it go, but I'm always happy to share it with everybody else. Um, it is on a much bigger and different scale um, than the previous maps that we had been discussing, which makes it in a different kind of category. It makes it phenomenally more expensive, um, and it makes it also just more difficult to have around, right? Um, our copy of the Mitchell map, as you will see when after the lecture, for those of you who are here, if you want to go and see some parts of the original, it was never stitched together which is why I've been using the version of the Mitchell map that's at the um, Library of Congress. It remains in separate uncut sheets. And this is how you would buy it. You would buy it in uncut sheets, and then you would sort of have them trimmed, have them arranged, put together, framed, but then you have to figure out what to do with it. So an awful lot of existing copies of the Mitchell map are still in sheets. You imagine someone kind of buying it and then like never getting around to going through all the effort <laughs> of getting it put together, which is extremely relatable. I think I have things like that sitting in my house. Because um, it was something that required a lot of capital, a lot of wall space, a lot of time and consideration, um, which might explain why George Washington himself didn't actually own this map. <laughs> Unlike the previous two, we know he had copies of the, of the Evans map. He used it extensively. We know he had copies of the Fred Jefferson map. It appears in his probate. Uh, he didn't own a copy of the Mitchell map, as far as we can tell. And in fact, what we can see is that when he wanted to view it, this is in 1789, he actually, this is when he was president, he sent his secretary over to say, hey guys, I need to take a look at the Mitchell map. Can you just like hand it to the servant and bring it over to my house? And so now I have this you know, mental image of, of whoever this poor person is like running through the streets of New York carrying something that's that size that's been taken off the wall of Congress and like breathlessly getting it to Washington's house. And he's like, thank you. That'll be all. But again, this is exactly why I wanted to emphasize this public role of these large maps. So bringing it back to this again, um, it is believed that if you see the um, a smaller square on the left of that image above the doorway, that is most likely the Mitchell map. We know that the Mitchell map hung in Independence Hall. Um, it hung opposite another very large map that we're going to talk about in a moment, the Popple map. Uh, the Mitchell map was also in the... Um, Boston uh, legislature. It hung in a lot of colonial and later state um, governmental offices, uh, both for reference, uh, but also just as kind of a show of, you know, this is North America, this is where we are. As you can see, and has been pointed out in this image, the, where, where the Mitchell map is in Independence Hall makes it very difficult to examine it. It's kind of way up on the wall. Um, so it's kind of not really necessarily existing for practical purposes there, so much as just saying, like, here it is. Um, and the Mitchell map was very popular for that because it was, and it remains, the most important map of North America of the 18th century. I have called this map the Google base map of the 18th century because if you had someone 
after this map was published, who wanted to know something about North America, that was the first map you went to. If you wanted to make your own map displaying some kind of an infographic, if we want to use modern terms, you would go to the Mitchell map and use that as your base for what North America looked like. Um, this continues to be true um, for quite some time, much longer to the extent that might be surprising. Um, and as we will also see, because this map was so influential and important during a period of great change, you know, after this map was published, we saw uh, the French lose their North American colonies. Uh, we saw the emergence of the United States. We saw, um, you know, Western expansion. We saw the creation of new colonies, new states, new provinces. It became used in a lot of legal situations when people were trying to determine borders. Um, and as a little preview, probably the most single influential moment in which it's used is in the 1783 negotiations over the Treaty of Paris, in which the American Revolution ended um, and the independence of the United States was recognized and secured. Um, so that is one of the reasons why, as Dr. Spiro mentioned, it continues to be an important map, even today. Um, when litigating borders that were created during this period, we use this map because this is the map that they use. So tremendously important, also very big. Those are the two things. If you take away nothing else uh, from this lecture, <laughs> those are the two things. Large map, very important. So how do we get here? How was this thing created? Um, and the way I want to get to this is first I want to talk about the creator of the map itself because he's also a little different than the previous people that we've talked about. So the Fry Jefferson map was created, as I mentioned, um, by Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson, both of whom were professional surveyors, among other things. Um, they had done many, many surveys prior to being commissioned to create the Fry Jefferson map. Evans, as well, was one of the best surveyors um, in the area before he made the Evans map. He made his career you know, doing the work, going out uh, with his chain, making measurements, making maps. Dr. Mitchell is different. He didn't do any of that. As far as I know, he didn't even know how to survey. Um, he was born to a relatively wealthy Virginia family, 1711, for, of Scottish extraction, but he was born in the colonies. Um, he was educated at the University of Edinburgh in medicine. Um, there, he got his master's degree. There is no evidence that he actually finished med school, but he nevertheless, as you can see here, referred to himself and was referred to it by others as MD, which is maybe a bit of stolen medical valor. I don't know. Time will judge him. And by the mid-1730s, he's back in Virginia practicing medicine, which that wasn't so uncommon. They had the lower standards for doctors back then, but doctors also had lower standards, so, you know. Um, but one of his great passions, though, was um, the natural world um, and botany in particular, um, as well as all other kinds of learned pursuits. Can I have a show of hands? Who in the room has heard the term natural philosopher or natural philosophy before? Okay, a couple scattered hands, which is a little unfortunate because now I have to explain it. Um, and it's hard and weird to explain because it's unlike anything in, the, in modern times, right? We don't have anything that's easily comparable to a natural philosopher because it's kind of like being a scientist. Um, so we have natural philosophers are known for doing experiments. They're known for going out into the world and making observations, in this case, about potash. Um, but they are also, you know, kind of philosophers. They might dabble in things that we today do no longer see as scientific. They don't tend to specialize in the intense way that we expect scientists to do today. So it's kind of a, um, a, a large catch-all term. It also tends to refer to folks that are pretty high up in the social strata. They have a lot of social capital. They often have a lot of financial capital. It is a gentlemanly pursuit, right? And John Mitchell was one of these guys. Um, he was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society in 1744, which in Philadelphia, which was the um, American Learned Society, which still exists to this day. Um, and then after he moved back to the UK, which he did for health reasons, which um, having spent several summers in Virginia now I can relate to, um, he and his wife moved back to, well, not so much back to, but moved to London in 1746. Um, at which point he was elected to the Royal Society, which was the much larger, much older, much more um, established and storied um, society for folks that are interested in these kinds of pursuits. So he was doing things like this. Um, and once he went to London, he stopped the doctoring thing altogether. He didn't feel like he could compete with the local doctors in London, which was probably true. Um, and he instead made his living um, advising gentlemen about exotic plants in their garden. So a man of great range, although you may have noticed at this point, none of which involves anything about maps. 
Uh, he also wrote a pamphlet in this earlier period called An Essay Upon the Causes of Different Colors of People in Different Climates, which I didn't excerpt here for reasons I hope are obvious. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's sort of the milieu he was running in. And the argument of that is that people are different colors because um, when it's hot, your skin looks different. Very popular 18th century argument. Um, you don't see Mitchell sort of swinging into the map, geography, um, cartography business uh, until the 17, late, late 1740s, early 1750s. So these two pamphlets are from much later in his life. He dies in 1768. Again, Mitchell Map comes out 1755. The pamphlet on the left is 1757. The pamphlet on the right is 1767. Uh, um, and it seems like he kind of came into the map game backwards. The sense is that once he was in London, he was running around with a fairly rarefied crew. Um, it became known that there was demand for a new map of the colonies. As a colonial gentleman, um, I think he saw this as a great opportunity for himself, and he refashioned himself into a map guy, which as someone who has refashioned herself into a map person, I relate to on a deep level, less so the potash. So that brings us to this guy. Uh, those of you who have been to my previous lectures will remember him. This is my frenemy. This is my uh, problematic fave, uh, George Montague Dunk, the second Earl of Halifax, uh, the founder of my hometown of Halifax, which I was always thankful was not named Dunkville. Um, and he is most notable for this period because he is the president of the Board of Trade. The Board of Trade is the body in London which is responsible for overseeing colonial affairs. And Halifax in particular, um, he had a vision. He was a guy, you can say a lot of things about the guy, but he had vision. Um, and he, you know, when he gazed across the Atlantic uh, into North America, what he saw was a huge mess and he hated it. Um, and he wanted to organize things better. He wanted to put everyone on a uniform, uniform plan. Um, and he was also, as were most observers during this time, concerned about increasing tensions between the French and the British, which would later evolve into the Seven Years' War. Um, and so all of this meant he wanted information. He wanted a sense of what, what was going on in the colonies, and he wanted geographic information, and he was not happy with what was currently available. So as you'll recall, Fry Jefferson map, he was a main player. Uh, Evans map, no, we don't care about him. But now we care about him again. Now he's really important. Um, and as you can even see, he gets a specific shout out in the cartouche of the Mitchell map. So cartouches are these little decorative elements. This one's in the lower right-hand corner of the map to give the name of the map, the date of publication, things like that. And this map is specifically dedicated to the Earl of Halifax because it was his idea. He also gave Mitchell the tools he needed to make this map. As we already said, Mitchell was not a surveyor, and he, so he didn't come over either with the know-how to do this thing or with really any of the papers. Both Evans, Fry, and Jefferson all had um, personal connections with other surveyors as well as their own sort of back catalog, if you will, that they could draw on when putting together their larger maps. What Mitchell had was access to the archives of the Board of Trade. So Halifax said, okay, I need a map. You're going to be our map guy. Here you go. Get in there. Find the stuff. Figure it out. Make me a map. Uh, there is a draft map as early as 1750. Um, a improved one based on his time in the archive comes out 1755, and that is the version that then gets published um, and made popularly, popularly, although maybe not as popularly as some of our smaller, less expensive maps, um, available. So once again, so the Seven Years' War is the immediate context for this. So 1755, the war formally has not yet been declared, but by this point there has already been armed conflict in North America. Um, George Washington has had a front row seat to this. He is sometimes blamed uh, or credited or blamed um, for causing the war in the first place, although if he didn't do it, somebody else would have been, would have, it was a tinderbox, absolutely. Um, so there has been fighting in the Ohio country, which is the popular name for sort of the area in the back country, the whole sort of larger, greater Ohio Valley, including parts of what we now consider to be Virginia, Pennsylvania, and surrounding states. Uh, there had also been fighting up in uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. So all of these sort of hashed areas in this map, those were really the areas of contention. They were claimed by both the French and the British, of course, in practice. They were the homelands of indigenous peoples, the French and the British. We're not as particularly bothered by that. They were much more concerned about the claims of the other empires. Um, so that's the immediate context. 
Halifax needs information about this area on which he can base claims, on which he can make arguments, on which he can say, the, all of this is British, and here is my proof. My proof is in this map and these other documents. So that is Mitchell's aim, and that is what Mitchell is aiming to do with the creation of this map. Uh, this is right. So this is the Evans map, roughly. Uh, this is a reminder of the important uh, uh, conflict uh, background to that one in particular. Um, and then there's Fred Jefferson, and then there's, of course, the Mitchell map, which it's just, it's really big, guys. It's a really big map. I just want to keep emphasizing that. However, interestingly enough, it is not the biggest map. We're right now on big map stage of the lecture. Um, because the map that Mitchell was looking to replace, the map that the Board of Trade had previously been using, because they did not have no map, of course, they're, you know, gentlemen of, of, of knowledge, and so of course they need geographic reference. The map they had been using is what's known as the Popple map. Um, this was made in 1733. Um, and it had come under critique not only for being out of date, you know, a lot of things happened in the colonies between the 1730s and the 1750s, but it was also often critiqued uh, for being too French. Uh, Popple, when he was putting this map together, relied heavily and almost exclusively on French sources. Um, and it was by the 1750s, and even at the time, uh, people would look at it and say, well, I think you're taking these French claims a little bit too seriously. Um, I, I, we want a map that is much more stridently making our case, that is not accidentally saying, for example, that maybe the French um, possess Louisiana. That's ridiculous. Uh, we want a British map, something better than Popple. But the other thing to know about Popple is that it's even bigger than the Mitchell map somehow, if this is possible. So here's the size comparison. Yeah, this thing is absolutely massive. So I was at the APS for a year, um, several years ago, uh, and I got to see them bring out their copy of the Popple map, which was, I believe the copy of the Popple map, because this was also an Independence Hall, and APS has that copy of it. And it took up an entire like actual stage. Like this thing is, the Mitchell map is big, but the Popple map is like, wow. That's large. It's more. It's a statement piece. It's like if you have this in your house, you don't have anything else in your house. Um, so the Mitchell map. I also mentioned you know, the Popple map was very rare. Very, very, very few people had access to a full copy of it. So the Mitchell map being at a slightly large, smaller scale, slightly more manageable scale, I don't think is a mistake. So it was meant to both rectify maybe the supposed French bias of Popple, um, as well as its sort of unmanageably massive proportions. And then this is just a reminder. Oh, no, it's not. This is something different. I didn't even do that. That's a spoiler. Um, OK, so the Mitchell map. We know that it was compiled from multiple sources. We know this is not a primary document to get sort of history teacher hat mode on. Um, we know that this is created um, as an act of archival exploration uh, by someone who is primarily sort of a learned compiler uh, rather than a map maker per se. So what are the sources? What are the sources that Mitchell is using? Well, he's still using those French maps. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that in the 1750s, the French, this changes over time, but at this moment, the French still had a better history, better track record with map making. Most of the good North American maps were French in origin. So Mitchell continues to draw on those maps for the larger shape of the continent. So uh, particularly ones made by uh, this gentleman, um, uh, Jacques Nicolas Bellin. Um, so this is one of his maps. He also used, we know, the Fry Jefferson map. Evans also used the Fry Jefferson map. Um, Fry Jefferson's supremacy in Virginia context cannot be overstated. This really was the map of Virginia. Um, and then he's also using other manuscript sources as well, including um, the journal of Christopher Gist. Christopher Gist came up when we were discussing the Fry Jefferson map um, as a figure who was in the employ of the Ohio Company. He sometimes worked for the governor of Virginia. He made a number of expeditions sort of out towards the Ohio River Valley. He accompanied Washington, as seen here in this extremely accurate photograph. It's from the 19th century, I'm sorry, I just think it's fun, um, <laughs> of, of Washington and Gist um, on the Ohio River. Um, and this uh, journal was something that Mitchell relied on heavily when he was drawing this crucial Ohio country area. He also more than likely used um, a primary source made by none other than George Washington himself. So we can just take a, this is not the most crucial piece of um, material to the creation of the Mitchell map, uh, but it is kind of a fun, I think I'm contractually obligated to point out uh, Washington uh, intersections here. So I will do that here. This is in the UK National Archives. This is a manuscript map that Washington made um, in his expedition to the Ohio, 1753, 1754. 
Um, and this is the kind of thing that Mitchell would have been uh, pulling using when he was creating his map. A lot of little manuscript surveys like this, including probably this one by George Washington. So what do we get when we put it all together? Unlike the Popple map, this really is a map about British supremacy. This is a map that is making the claim for British uh, rights to North America in a very, very, very strident way. One of the most obvious ways in which it's doing that is how he has drawn the borders of the uh, American colonies, British colonies. As you can see, they kind of just keep going and they do not stop. Uh, they hit the end of the map and you get the sense that they, you know, they just keep trucking all the way to the Pacific. Uh, this is not based in any kind of on the ground reality. It is not even necessarily based on what a lot of these colonies were claiming. Uh, most of the time when you saw these sort of charter arguments, even if theoretically they were C2C, generally speaking, people understood that practically they would stop at the Mississippi at the very least, since uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on out there. Um, and here I want to emphasize this idea of charters rather than treaties going into the way that Mitchell is creating this map. Um, in the Evans map, which we'll do a direct comparison with in a moment, um, Lewis Evans was very concerned uh, with relying on sort of treaties to show the borders of, of British settlement. He wanted to use things that had been sort of arbitrated between the two parties, um, as well as was maybe a little bit more grounded. Again, he's, he's, he's making some leaps here. It's certainly not a neutral map. He is also in the can for big British claims to North America. I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but not in the way that Mitchell is, right? Mitchell is really taking a maximalist approach here to what British claims mean, what British claims look like. Um, he's also a big fan of Big Virginia, which we'll talk about momentarily. Um, and he says that explicitly. He sort of has a little note where he says, the reason they go all this way is because we have a piece of paper that says they go all this way, therefore they go all this way, which is, again, not something that the French would agree with. Um, and this is also a preview that this map is one of the uh, most obvious things about this map when you get a chance to kind of get up close and personal and look at it is the sheer amount of annotations that are on here. There's an awful lot of text, there's an awful lot of notes. Mitchell wants you to know about his sources, he wants you to know about his opinions, he wants you to know um, who lived here, who doesn't live here, um, all with a varying range of accuracy. But yeah, so here's, here's where Big Virginia comes in. So here's Virginia, of course. This is what Virginia looks like. Um, and then this is Virginia in the Evans map. So as you can see, both of them are interested in a Virginia that stretches beyond the current uh, settlements that are in Virginia. Um, I'm going to walk over here momentarily. This is a test with the lapel mic. Uh, on this map, you can uh, see there's, a, there's he makes a comment here that this is the furthest range of settlements in Virginia. Still has Virginia going back a little bit further. Um, but Mitchell is like, I see you, but I raise you. Virginia. <laughs> and then it just keeps going. <laughs> Everything the light touches is Virginia. And it also goes up quite a bit further as well. So that is the Mitchell map. It is big. It is British. Um, and it is here. It is a compilation that is meant to become and did become the definitive expression of British power in North America at this mid-century moment. So how does it get used? This is arguably one of the most important things about the Mitchell map, which is why um, I'm not gonna spend much time on it. Um, although certainly in questions, I am happy to elaborate on any of these features, but I just wanna give you a little bit of a taste about uh, the importance of the Mitchell map as a document and how it becomes involved in these uh, legal disputes, in these border considerations, highlighting, of course, its role in the Treaty of Paris. Um, so this was the map that was used during that negotiation. So when Ben Franklin and his pals sat down with a bunch of um, less memorable and less charismatic British commissioners, um, the map they were looking at when they were trying to decide, okay, where does this new United States end and the remaining British colonies begin was the Mitchell map. And we actually have a copy of one of those maps. This is called the red line copy of the Mitchell map. It's held at the British Library. This was the copy of the map that was used by one of the, one of the British commissioners and then owned by George III. Um, it is called the red line map because it's got red lines on it. It's not always the most creative with naming, but you know, it works. Um, and so you can imagine them sitting there pouring over it. They've drawn on, speaking of treaties, uh, previous treaty lines um, that have taken place between the British and the French, um, as well as additional information about state borders. Um, and then they have kind of made a provisional line, as you can see, it runs up through uh, 
the modern Canadian province of New Brunswick and kind of over dividing up this area, saying, okay, this is this is our understanding. This is a this is a um, physical pictorial demonstration of what we think. What is the United States? What yeah, is British territory? And then everyone um, dusted off their hands and said, "Good work. This will never come up ever again." There's that solved. That didn't happen. No spoilers. Okay, but spoilers. Um, so yeah, it didn't work. The problem with the Mitchell map is that it actually is not all that accurate. Yeah, maybe not shocking. Um, it, it doesn't quite have both the Fred Jefferson map and the Evans map are more accurate for their areas than the Mitchell map is for reasons that I think are probably pretty obvious. First of all, it's a gigantic undertaking and it covers a lot of areas that didn't have the kind of level of on the ground survey um, that others did. And it turns out that a lot of the areas where that survey quality was at very low resolution were exactly the areas where that border was supposed to run through. The example that I always use to the extent that it is in my dissertation and I can and have given entire talks of this length and longer that are solely about this issue, so if you wanna waste some time, let me know after the talk, um, is how this worked when it came to this uh, Northeast border here which is why I've kind of zoomed in. So this is the modern US, well, it's not the modern US-Canada border, but the version of it, this that is eventually decided on is the modern US-Canada border that runs between the state of Maine and the province of New Brunswick. Um, and the problem here is that in this version of it, uh, the commissioner sat down, they looked at the map, they said, well, okay, here's the St. Croix River. The St. Croix River had been used as a boundary in written texts for hundreds of years at this point. It was considered to be the border between what was then the colony of Massachusetts and the colony of Nova Scotia. So they said, okay, this is the obvious border. We'll just use the St. Croix River. That's fine. Drew a line up it, went on to other things. The problem, as several other people not in that room already knew, is that there actually was no St. Croix River. It is a bit of an issue. <laughs> so they get there and they say, okay. 